In the late 1800s, there was a small Italian presence in Ontario. Between 1901 and 1910, according to Employment and Immigration Canada, approximately 53,000 Italians entered Canada. Although Canadian government policy was set up to discourage Italian immigration, the Italian government established the Commissariato Generale dell'Immigrazione to help the migrants reach their destinations. Thus, Italian workers could be found throughout Canada at the turn of the century. They came as laborers from various regions in Italy, Calabria, Friuli, Veneto, Abruzzi, and Sicily. By the early 1900s, migration to Canada became a common occurrence. The reasons for this migration were very complex. Among them, the social and economic factors in Italy, along with the rising expectations of social and economic well-being in Canada. Young male migrants landed first in New York and then wound their way to the rest of North America, including Ontario. Most had no formal education and sought readily available low-skilled jobs where they could earn money quickly. They hoped to eventually return to Italy to buy land and houses. Throughout this process, the padroni were the key to bringing migrants to Canada because they were the middlemen between Canadian employers and Italian workers. They provided not only jobs for Italians, but also all the goods and services they needed. The Italian migrants intended to return to Italy. In essence, physically they were separated from their paese, or town, but mentally they were still there because the padroni were able to provide them with all the goods and services they needed to remain isolated from Canadian society and attached to their paese. Thousands of men were encouraged and admitted west to work on railroad construction and maintenance, as well as Canada's mines, lumber camps, and building projects. Italians also had a very important impact in northern Ontario, traveling north to Sault Ste. Marie, Cobalt, Capriol, Timmins, Sudbury, and surrounding areas. Anywhere there was heavy, dangerous seasonal work, there were Italian men. They lived in camps with horrid conditions, mosquito-ridden and squalid in the summer, barren and unheated in the winter. Nevertheless, they were not merely docile workers. They went on strike. By going on strike, Italians were also demonstrating that they had become immigrants, settlers who were making a life for themselves in Canada. They needed enough money to live, not as migrants, but as immigrants with mortgages to pay off, families to support, and so on. Few Italians became involved as farmers, despite Canadian officials discouraging all immigration but that of farmers and farm laborers from Northern Europe. For many Italians, farm work was a means of getting into Canada. These farmers left the farms as quickly as possible for better paying jobs in the cities. Of those who did remain, some bought fruit orchards in St. Catharines, Welland, and Port Robinson. Others bought farms in Sault Ste. Marie, Port Arthur, and Fort William, while many truck farmers grew vegetables on the outskirts of Toronto. The permanent population in the town was due to members of a family holding jobs in the town's main industry or individuals who found a niche in the service or fruit retail trades in the cities, selling Italian goods in family-run businesses. This permanent population supplemented their income by keeping Italian lodgers during the winter. These boarding situations provided the sojourners with the only sense of family. There they could eat traditional food and take part in picnics, fishing trips, music, and church activities. In their attempts to increase their numbers, the Protestant churches in the city of Toronto divided the immigrant groups for conversion among themselves. The Methodists were given the responsibility of converting the Italians, and they went to work with great enthusiasm. They followed Italians to new areas near changing work sites. These missionaries felt that changing neighborhoods was positive because the few Italians who were converted in one mission and returned to other colonies would preach the gospel to their countrymen. However, their success rate was very poor due to the Italians' cultural Catholicism. Italian parishes emerged across the towns of Ontario. Our Lady of Mount Carmel was the first Italian parish in Toronto's Little Italy, established in 1908. These churches provided the immigrants not only with a place of worship, but also a meeting place where they could organize dinner dances, feasts, and processions to honor the saints who were also honored back home. 
Other religious traditions which continued to play a major role in the lives of the immigrants' families were baptism and Holy Communion. Often these rites of passage were celebrated with a small party. With the emergence of Italians in cities such as Toronto, Sault Ste. Marie, St. Catharines, we find Italians in a variety of jobs, many of which were construction. Italian men could be found paving roads, working on sewage systems, and in setting up electrical lines in the city. Some major construction companies were headed by Italians. Dufferin Construction was established in the summer of 1918 by James Franceschini. Some of the projects throughout Ontario, built by this company, were part of the highway to Hamilton, the CNR Yards in Leaside, and the Dundas Highway, also known as Route 5. Other well-known businesses, such as the Florentine Company, also emerged during this period. Aside from the construction industry, many Italians who settled in the cities had a trade, if only at the apprentice level. Some Italian immigrants brought skills with them to the city's economy, while others learned certain skills during the course of finding work. Thus we find Italians making shoes, tailoring clothes, working as stonemasons, barbers, copper grinders, cutters, mirror makers, corset makers, carriage and coat makers, coal and wood dealers, banana peddlers, music teachers, tobacco and cigar retailers, boot makers, figurine and model makers, plasterers, weavers, confectioners, restaurateurs, butchers, instrument makers, and the list goes on. The ideal of some Italian immigrants was to use these skills to start small family businesses and therefore during this period there is an emergence of tailor shops, shoe repair shops and a large number of food markets. Many Italian entrepreneurs also catered to an ethnic clientele such as grocers, steamship agents, musicians and bankers. Women were essential to these family businesses and often managed them while their husbands worked in factories or construction. If women were not involved in family businesses, they could often be found in industries which required minimal skills but were labor intensive, such as meatpacking and needle trade. Those working in the needle trade usually worked piecework and often took work home in the evenings and on weekends. Women also supplemented the family income by running boarding houses and performing the necessary tasks involved. Many of these jobs allowed Italian women to maintain their roles as mothers and wives while contributing to the financial stability of the family. The family in the Italian culture plays an extremely important role. The nuclear family was surrounded by the extended family, which included relations up to second cousins. Traditions and values bound these families together and facilitated immigration and adaptation to the new world. One of the traditions, Sistemazione was a process by which Italians tried to set up their children in marriage. For example, women received a dowry and men received either land or money. Relatives also pitched in to help the new couple establish themselves. Italians continued to practice their traditions and customs in Canada as well as adopting some Canadian customs along the way. For example, in Italian marriage ceremonies, it was customary to have only a comara compare, or in other words, maid of honor, best man. Italians kept this tradition and also adopted the North American custom of having bridesmaids and ushers in their wedding party. Life during the post-World War I period included many other activities outside of work. Many clubs and social events were organized to create not only the ambiente, which was left behind in Italy, but also to establish a sense of community and have places for social recreation. In Toronto, there was an Italian national club and the city's first three mutual aid societies had national names, such as the Umberto Primo, the Vittorio Emanuele, and the Operaia Italiana. These clubs and associations were open to all Italians. The Società di Mutuo Soccorso Italo Canadese was established in 1919 and was an umbrella association which incorporated the smaller clubs representing the various pay